so much, Suki. That was great. So um, we are going to move on to the symptom management portion of the morning session. Um, and by the way, Dr. Pata will be here, I think, for a little bit longer for the Q&A, so she'll be able to answer some questions a little bit later. Um, so um, I will um, actually be going next. I will we'll talk a little bit about carcinoid syndrome and management. Um, that will be followed by um, Dr. Berkeley Limket Kai, who's a gastroenterologist, who will talk about um, diarrhea management that is not associated with carcinoid syndrome. And then we will finish up the morning talk with a discussion about survivorship and our survivorship fair. <clears throat> All right, I gotta get all my, my clickers ready. Okay, so carcinoid syndrome and management. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about causes of diarrhea in nets. Um, carcinoid syndrome and what the definition of that is. We talked a little bit on, about that in the primer this morning. Um, talk about somatostatin analogs, octreotide and lanreotide, and then talk about a new um, drug that is hopefully soon to be FDA approved called telotrostat. So causes of diarrhea and nets. So what I will and will not be talking about this morning. So I will be talking about carcinoid syndrome, but I'm gonna leave all the other causes of diarrhea for Dr. Lim Ketkai to talk about. So um, he will be talking about um, short gut syndrome, bile acid malabsorption, pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, infectious diarrhea, irritable bowel. So as you can see, there are actually many causes of diarrhea that can occur in patients with nets you may have more than one of them. And I think a really important, this is actually a, a tough diagnostic dilemma for many physicians, is really trying to tease out what is causing your diarrhea. And so don't assume that diarrhea means that you have carcinoid syndrome. I think that's another really important take home. Okay, clinical features of carcinoid syndrome. So as we learned earlier, carcinoid syndrome is defined by symptoms that are caused by hormone excess, and hopefully a hormone that we can measure. I have definitely taken care of patients who have what we think are symptoms of carcinoid syndrome, but we can't quite identify the hormone. That's less common. Um, we think that these symptoms are due to the production of polypeptides, amines, and prostaglandins. Serotonin is the most common. A metabolite of serotonin is measured in the urine called urine 5-HIAA. Serotonin um, is really tough to measure. It's a blood marker, um, but can fluctuate quite a bit during the day, and so tends to just be a little bit less reliable. There is a new test that is a plasma 5-HIA that is still being tested to see if it's as accurate as the 24-hour urine test. So the symptoms include flushing, diarrhea, bronchospasm includes things like asthma, wheezing, difficulty breathing, um, and heart, sorry, typo there, heart valve disease. So serotonin can cause fibrosis of the heart valves, um, and so over time that can manifest as difficulty breathing or exercise problems, and we can identify that on an ultrasound of the heart. So for patients who have carcinoid syndrome, monitoring the heart is part of the surveillance. Um, carcinoid syndrome is more common in small intestine nets than in others. Dr. Pata just mentioned it does happen occasionally in lung nets, but much less commonly. Um, the pictures on the left of your screen um, is a picture of flushing that it can, can occur on the back. And then there is a picture of um, a cheek that can show chronic vascular changes that in fact some patients are misdiagnosed as having rosacea. So that may have happened to some of you in this room, but there can be chronic blood vessel changes that cause a pinkness of the cheeks. Um, on the right is a picture of a heart valve that has scarring or fibrosis on it due to the serotonin. So tools for hormone control. So really the mainstay of how we manage symptoms from carcinoid syndrome are through somatostatin analogs. So these include things like octreotide, which you've heard about, and there are a few others. Octreotide has been around a long time. It was first FDA approved for the management of carcinoid syndrome. So approved, so we have a little timeline here. So approved back in the 80s, we've talked already about the somatostatin receptor. It, it has the strongest affinity um, for somatostatin receptor type two. It's approved in both the US and Europe for functional nets and for another endocrine syndrome called acromegaly.
land reatide was approved um, in 2011. Um, it also has almost an identical affinity or attachment to that somatostatin receptor type 2. It's approved in the US for acromegaly um, and NETS and in Europe for the same. And patients and physicians actually often ask, well, what's the difference between the two? I really think of these as being interchangeable. They have the same mechanism of action. Lanreotide is newer, but they work very similarly. So if you happen to um, sort of lose hormone control on one, you might consider trying the other, but I would anticipate there would be a very similar response. They are administered differently. Octreotide can be administered in both a short-acting form and a long-acting acting intramuscular form, and lanreotide is given through a deep subcutaneous injection. We can answer questions on that later. Um, and then the last of these is pasreotide, which is the newest of the three. Um, it is approved in US and Europe for Cushing's, but not for carcinoid syndrome. Um, and then the new kit on the block is, or soon, hopefully soon to be, um, telotrostat, which is actually a pill for the management of carcinoid syndrome. It actually blocks the enzyme that synthesizes serotonin. So we mentioned that serotonin is often responsible for many forms of carcinoid syndrome. And if you can just block its production, that can, we'll talk about the clinical trial um, that has studied it, but the hope is that that then decreases flushing and diarrhea. Okay, so SSA or somatostatin analog physiology. So somatostatin analogs actually derive from a naturally occurring protein called somatostatin. This was studied back in the mid-1900s and is a naturally occurring protein, but we can't use it because it, its half-life is only minutes, so it's just not practical to use in a clinical setting. So its effects are inhibitory. So it decreases the secretion of hormones, blood flow, and cell proliferation. So we talk about octreotide having originally been approved for the management of carcinoid syndrome, but as Dr. Pada mentioned, and we'll talk about later today, we also know that these somatostatin analogs slow down the growth of neuroendocrine tumors, so it does both. So synthetic somatostatin analogs have been developed that have longer half-lives, meaning that they, can, they are just more practical for clinical use. So octreotide, lanreotide, and pasreotide. So principles of somatostatin analog dosing for hormone control. So if a patient has carcinoid syndrome, we typically recommend starting with both short-acting and long-acting. So the short-acting octreotide is given as a subcutaneous injection, so a small needle under the skin, like an insulin shot would be. It can be given between one and four times per day, and that helps give more immediate relief. We also recommend simultaneously starting with a long-acting shot, which is given monthly, typically. Um, continue the short-acting rescue doses as needed, start that long-acting shot, and then the dose and the frequency can be titrated for symptoms. Um, what we also recommend is if you anticipate having a big surgery, um, sometimes even a big dental procedure, that you need to get octreotide before and or after that procedure to help reduce the risk of something called carcinoid crisis. Um, Josh also mentioned having a MedAlert bracelet that is specifically for this reason. I think carcinoid syndrome patients in particular, we advocate doing that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about two clinical trials that have um, led to the knowledge that we have about how we manage carcinoid syndrome. And so lanreotide is one of them, just briefly on clinical trials, because I didn't include these in my definitions earlier. Dr. Bergsland will be talking about clinical trials later. But phase one clinical trials look at safety of drugs. Phase two trials look at are they effective, but in a small group of patients. And phase three trials look, are they effective in a larger group of patients, often hundreds, and are usually comparing it to another treatment or a placebo. So in this case, this is a phase three study of lanreotide for carcinoid syndrome called the ELECT trial. Um, it is a phase three trial. It randomizes patients. So about 60 patients got lanreotide, and another 60 got placebo. And then they were on that for about 12 weeks, and then all patients could cross over and get the lanreotide. So the pur purpose of this was to look at the percent of days of use of rescue octreotide. So trying to figure out, did the land, was there a difference in needing to use that short-acting octreotide 
in the patients who already got the long-acting dose of lanreotide. And so what this demonstrated is that indeed, so you can see on that bottom bullet, lanreotide, patients who got lanreotide only used the short-acting 34% of the time compared to about 50% of the time for patients who got placebo. So this showed that lanreotide does help with hormone control. So the newest study um, that was just recently published is on telotrostat. So this is the pill that controls symptoms of carcinoid syndrome. And this was a three-arm study. So 45 patients got placebo, 45 patients got a dose of 250 milligrams of telotrostat, and the third arm was 500 milligrams of telotrostat. It's, it's dosed three times a day. And so on this figure, I'm just going to walk you through this. I'm sorry I don't have a pointer. But in the gray line up top, the purpose of this, I'll give you the take-home point first, is that it shows that the, the lines with blue and yellow show a decrease in bowel movements compared to the placebo. So the pill decreases bowel movements um, compared to patients that did not receive any of the active medications. So the gray line in this, the um, red is the double-blind period, meaning Neither doctors nor patients knew what drug was that the patients were receiving. The placebo shows change from baseline and number of bowel movements, and then the yellow and the blue lines are both the active drug. They were trying to determine if there was a significant difference between the two doses, but there really was not. Um, this is just another way of looking at it, I think a little bit easier. You can see on placebo, the 250 milligram dose and the 500 milligram dose the number of bowel movements at baseline compared to week 12. So you can see that, in fact, there's actually a decrease in all three of those. So you've heard of a placebo effect. So even the placebo patients did have a slight decrease, but that decrease in bowel movements was more profound in the patients who were receiving telotrostat. And then lastly, the take home from this slide is that remember that hormone that we think is responsible for causing carcinoid syndrome? That hormone, 5-HIA, also decreased on telotrostat. So you might ask, well, if this is a new drug, is this something that I should be considering? What are the side effects? What are the risks to me? So the side effects were actually pretty minimal. It caused some mild nausea, some increase in liver function tests. Um, there was a lot of um, interest in studying whether or not this caused depression. As you can, some of you may know, serotonin is involved um, with um, cognitive changes in the brain, and this drug does not is not thought to cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, there was a slight increase in depression at the very highest dose level, but it was not a significant change. And we anticipate the FDA to make a decision about this drug at the end of February, so within the next few weeks, so it's very exciting. So we now have, in terms of thinking about an algorithm for how to control symptoms, this is actually the first node when I, that I think about in treatment management for patients. Do they have a functional net or not? And we have two tools now to manage carcinoid syndrome, somatostatin analogs and telotrostat. So final thoughts here. Um, so diarrhea in net patients can be caused by many factors. Diarrhea does not always equal carcinoid syndrome, so be sure that you're talking with your doctor about, well, what type of diarrhea do you have? Carcinoid syndrome is defined as symptoms from hormone excess, and we have two tools now, somatostatin analogs and hopefully telotrostat. Thank you.